Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast. My name is Mike and Davina, and thanks for hanging out with me today. Today, my guest is Matthew Rufino, and if you're not familiar with him, Matthew is a mixing engineer based out of New Jersey, where he works out of a room inside of Barbershop Studios. He is also the broadcast music mixer for the NBC Today Show, where he mixes all of the live-to-air stuff whenever you see a musician on the Today Show. So he's worked with a lot of really big artists, such as Adele, Aerosmith, Taylor Swift, Dave Matthews Band, Robert Plant, Fleetwood Mac, Lady Gaga, and a whole bunch more doing all of that. And in this conversation, we have a great chat about how things translate from working on live-to-air stuff versus the studio and some of the challenges that come with mixing live music. And not only mixing live music, but mixing music that people are already very, very familiar with. So when you have a major musician on the Today Show... People already are familiar with how their hit songs sound. So how do you then replicate that live to air and with only an hour or sometimes even less to achieve those same results? So it's a really interesting conversation. And it was really great to learn more about what goes on behind the scenes at the Today Show and how Matt ultimately makes it sound so awesome so quickly. And we get into... All that side of things, we get into how this all translates to his studio and some of his processes there in terms of working fast and efficient there as well. So I think that there's just like so much great stuff in this chat that you're going to learn a lot from. So with that said, let's just jump right into it. Matthew Rufino, thank you so much for being on the Master Your Mix podcast. What's going on, man? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. For people who might not be familiar with you and all the cool stuff that you're up to these days, can you give us a little bit of background on who you are, what you do, and ultimately how you got into all this stuff? Sure. Um, I've been mixing now for, well, really almost 30 years now. Uh, I started when I was 12 with the four track. Uh, Currently, I mix the NBC Today Show, all the music that's on the show, uh, as well as have a studio uh, about an hour outside the city in New Jersey where I mix records and uh, live streaming stuff and record albums and, you know, pretty much everything. Amazing. How did you get into all this to begin with? Uh, you know, just like most people, when I was a kid, I got a guitar. My dad got me an acoustic guitar and I was like five. And then that turned into an electric. And then when I was 12, I'd already actually started with like doing, we used to have these like boom boxes that had microphones in them. So I'd record myself on the guitar into the boom box on cassette and then play that one back, play that cassette back on another boom box while recording another guitar through that boom. You know what I mean? So I had both of them going and it started with that. And then I got a little four track when I was 12 and it was like a Tascam Porta one, like the basic couple of faders and uh, no EQ, I think. And I just started working with that. And then when I was 14, I found a local recording studio and kind of knocked on their door. And luckily they took me in and I spent all of high school in a studio. And then it led to going to Avatar uh, Studios for four years where I started as an intern and kind of worked my way up. And then I went freelance and found the Today Show and that happened. And here I am. You know, Love it's it, been, been a, quite a journey. Yeah, I bet. So you were, you talked about um, Avatar and uh, I believe, yeah, you said you did that like when you were like 19, right? So you were pretty pretty young to get into a place like that. Yeah, I was just I was just shy of 20. I think I was like a couple of weeks shy of 20 years old when I got there. I remember they thought it was funny that I couldn't drink. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess that's right, because the drinking age in the States <laughs> is 21, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I couldn't go to the bar afterwards, but it was just an amazing experience, you know, just learning from all these guys, that amazing players that would come through, amazing musicians, amazing engineers. Um, every day was something new and, you know, being that young, you just try to absorb as much as you can. Of course. Yeah. I know that, um, like on your website, you'd mentioned that like you had the chance to work under guys like Al Schmidt or JJP or Michael Brower, that kind of thing. Like, so what was it like to, to be able to be working around those guys and seeing them in action? Like any, anything that really stand out to you there? Uh, it was so much, it was like such a jam packed education, you know, just try not get to not get kicked out of the room. I mean, Most of that time I spent as like the second assistant type of thing. Um, Avatar was pretty 
uh, packed with staff at the time. So I was like a production assistant, which was the level under assistant. And so I would help set up all the sessions and then help the assistant out and then assist a bunch. Um, and just watch everyone had a different way they worked, you know, seeing, you know, Al Schmidt work completely different than JJP worked, you know, which was completely different than Jason Corsaro worked, which is completely different than Neil Dorsman worked. They all had their thing and you would just take in every day and try to, you know, when I used to go in and sharpen pencils and all that stuff and clean up in the morning, I would just be writing down the settings on the console and what outboard they used on this. And then I'd sneak in later at night when we had some free time and try all that stuff and just kind of figure out or run a click track. Even when I was cleaning the console, I'd run a click track through the different compressors to hear the envelope and how it would change and the different sounds. Um, you know, so it was always just trying to learn while you were there. I love it. As far as like adapting to those different workflows, like I think that's a really uh, interesting thing to have to experience because, you know, as engineers, we're always trying to figure out like what our workflow looks like and how, you know, how we would record a band or work through the recording, editing and mixing process. So then to see all of these big names that have differing styles, you know, First off, how did you learn to adapt to that really quickly? And then I guess, secondly, like, you know, when it comes to adapting your own workflow, uh, you know, what does that look like in comparison to some of the stuff you were seeing? Uh, I think I was too young to know or even really realize, you know, it was such a, I was 20 years old. I was just a kid. I I, I didn't know. I was just watching, you know, just in awe. Uh, and you just try to pick up what these guys are doing and you run and get what you got to get and keep your mouth shut and stay out of the way and jump in when you need to help someone. And uh, try to keep the assistants happy, help them so you can get in the room and maybe watch them do overdubs. You know, I saw all these crazy things. I remember they were like, you know, recently I had a memory out of the blue where I remember Cheryl Crow was doing Soak Up the Sun. I'd heard it on the radio and like it popped into my mind. I was like, oh yeah, I was like walking through the room and they were like, making that drum loop. <laughs> uh, it's like crazy. You know, I totally forgot about it. And it's just, you know, all these different things you would just pick up here and there because I did. And as far as my workflow, um, I definitely pick all the things I like the best that everyone did and kind of made it my own. And actually recently I had to revisit a session I did in 2009. And then a week later had to revisit a mix I did in 2018. And I was pretty proud that the sessions opened up and everything was like super organized and right where it should be and everything sounded good and there was nothing missing. And, you know, I went back and did a better mix because we were doing some remix stuff on some different stuff. It was obviously better now having a lot more experience, but just the workflow when you're at a place like that of making sure every cable's in the right spot and everything is notated and labeled and color coded and, like, you know, you were working at that high level, uh, just being prepared. I mean, it's the same thing in television. I spend more time preparing than I do mixing. It's all about knowing that, like, every single thing is going to work when you need it to right then. And then you can be creative and not worry about a bunch of technical stuff. And you can be fast and you can make the artist happy quickly. Yeah, I love that, man. So as far as, like, some uh, preparation stuff in the studio, um, you know, what kind of things are you doing in advance of the artist coming in to just like make sure that, you know, everything does run smooth. I know you mentioned like some cables and that kind of stuff. Anything else you'd recommend? I mean, I, I want them to walk in and we can just go like hit record. Like the mics are already checked. Everything's working unless we need to change something. Signal flow set headphones are checked. Um, Every single thing you could think of from like, can they see each other properly? Do we need to like put a mirror in this corner so they can see each other better? Or, um, you know, so even just as far as like you're setting up the room, you want to, I sit in the chair where the musician's going to sit. How does it look to the drum kit? How does the bass player see the lead singer? You know, all that sort of stuff. Every single thing you could think of, like I'm always telling the guys that assist me, listen to what we're saying and what's going on and if someone mentions we might do an overdub at some point quietly walk out of the room and get it ready you know if someone says that hey, we got to add a b3 to this and we weren't planning on it like you know what i'm going to use on that go grab some mics and sort of get it ready just be a little bit more prepared or we recently had a situation where uh it was actually i just said b3 but it was another um organ overdub session and it was a 
using the stock house B3, which sounds great, but I could tell the artist wasn't comfortable with it and they wanted theirs, which was in their van outside. You know, they were on the road coming off a tour. And I looked at the assistants. I said, get ready. We got to bring in theirs. And they did like one more take. And sure enough, it's like, you know, I'm not so sure about this. I'm like, don't worry. The guys are already bringing your yours in. I could tell like, you know, we got it covered. We, we got you. So yeah. then they're like, awesome. It's not a problem. It's like, no, whatever you need to make it work. So it's just that sort of stuff, always staying on top of, of things. Yeah, I love that. I think that the, that's all amazing stuff to keep in mind. And it's just like, you know, don't wait for the client to be in the studio before you start doing any of that stuff, you know, just like make everyone happy and, and not like feel like a drag just waiting for you to get your work done, you know? Yeah, I mean, my live room isn't the biggest live room. It's it's sort of like, you know, you could record a full band in there, but there's no ISO boots. It's sort of like one bigger space. But my live room is set up so everything is mic'd up, ready to go all the time. It's already patched. It, it's already there. So if I'm working out of my space on something, it's more just about opening Pro Tools and opening the session, importing the tracks. Yeah. And, and then just dialing up levels. And, and it's sort of all set to go. So if they have an idea they want to do something, it's like, let's just do it. There's not even, you know, it's, we're, already, we're already recording. As far as like... Um getting started with your templates and being like, or maybe not a template, but even just your session in general um, and preparing for the artist to come in. Like, are you discussing inputs ahead of time and that kind of stuff as well? Or? Oh yeah. There's yeah. always conversations, you know, I'm always talking to the artist beforehand, whether it's recording or mixing or, you know, there's definitely always a dialogue and it's just, you know, trying to zone in on what they want, what they expect, figure out what their quirks are and how they work and just try to work with them to, to make them as happy as possible. Yeah, I love that. Um, to go back to your time at Avatar, you talked about how, um, you know, you were doing what you could to to stay in the room and uh, and not get kicked out or that kind of thing. Um, and on your website, you had mentioned something about how um, during that time that you were there, you made a lot of mistakes, but at the same time, you were there and you were getting cor corrected by some of the biggest engineers in the world. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of a fun thing to, to maybe dive into if you're open to that. But I'd love to know, like, do you remember some of those early mistakes that you made? Cause, oh, like, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure there's lots of things that people can learn from just that experience alone. I was assisting on this uh, off-Broadway show that they were recording. I, I don't remember the name of it now. And we were on 2-inch analog uh, doing 24-track. And uh, we they were working on this one song for a while, and they just couldn't get it. And they finally got the take. We recorded it. I wrote it down on the sheet. I queued up the tape to the wrong spot and went to record the next song, and I punched in about 10 seconds on the middle of the perfect take. And soon as I realized that I knew I was toast. So I kind of told the engineer and then I stepped out of the room and went to the manager's office and told him that he's going to have some pretty angry people in here pretty quickly. And Tino was an awesome guy. Tino Passante, he was the manager there at the time. And I said, you know, I totally get it if you want to fire me right now. And he said, you know, I'm not going to fire you, but now you got to go back in the room and figure this out and keep them happy for the next week or whatever it was that they were there. But if you do that again, you will get fired. <laughs> and so, you know, I learned my lesson there on that. Um, and that was probably the worst thing I've ever, ever done. I'll never, you know, let, let myself uh, get over that one. Yeah, you, at least you learned from it. And yeah, you, the extra It was a tough diligent. week after it. I was not treated so well. And, you know, I can't, I can't blame them now, but... Yeah, no, but I think that's a, that's kind of a classic story, I think, of like, you know, a typical mistake someone might make early on. And, you know, you, you very quickly learn, like, n never to do it again. And, and, and how no to, undo how buttons back it. then. Yeah, of course, right? <laughs> yeah, at least these days, undo can hopefully yeah. save you. Oh, you know? God, they only had that. <laughs> Right on, man. Well, so so you had worked at Avatar, and then you talked about um, getting into working with NBC on the Today Show as well. So what was that transition like for you? Uh, well, I had been at Avatar for about like four years. And at the time, it was the early 2000s, and it was Napster and iTunes, and like the label, the budgets were drying up. And Avatar was such a great place, like people weren't moving up. So I could tell like no assistant is leaving in the next year or two. Like, I don't want to keep being like the second assistant runner guy forever. Um, and I started looking around. I started talking to bands and I was really thinking about just trying to go freelance and just do it. And my father met the director of the Today Show on New Jersey Transit. 
Wow. And they started talking <laughs> and he said, you know, what do you do? And he said, oh, I directed today's show. And he said, oh, my son does, does sound. He works at a recording studio. And he gave my father a number. He said, give this guy a call. And I called this guy, this uh, one of the audio guys, this guy, Brian. And he said, yeah, come down and take a tour. So I went and met everyone and I talked to the manager and he said, you know, your resume is great. We could totally use you, but it's November and we're going to get slow through the winter. So give me a call in the spring. And this guy, Keith, I said, all right. So he gave me his number and then I just called him every Monday morning at 10 o'clock when the show ended every Monday morning for like six months. And he finally said, okay, you know, you can come in now. <laughs> and I came in and I was originally just plugging in mics on the stage. You know, it was like a stage A2. So plugging the band in and then they said, well, can you mix monitors? And I said, sure. And I'd never mixed monitors. I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was like, yeah, I can totally do that. And then, so I got like two days of training and next thing you know, I'm mixing like Elvis Costello with like 17 wedges and side fills and subs. And like, it was probably the worst monitor mix he ever had <laughs> in his life, <laughs> but I somehow got through it. And then they were like, okay, well you can do monitors now you're, you're approved. So then I was doing <laughs> monitors and then that led into mixing broadcast and Coming up this uh, April will be 20 years. Wow. Yeah, it's been a run. That's pretty pretty wild. And and uh, all from a little public transit. Alter- yeah. You know, uh, that, that's amazing. That's uh, goes to show you, like, you know, connections can come anywhere, you know. You never know. Yeah. You know, you never know. I wasn't expecting. It was never something in my thought process that I would end up in TV. I didn't even really know it was a job, you know, it's something I never thought of, like who mixes the live music on a TV show. Yeah. I just wanted to make records. That's really interesting too. Cause like, yeah, I kind of always assumed that, you know, these big touring acts have their own crew that they travel with. And, you know, there's probably someone at the studio who's like, or the station who's, you know, taking their master output and putting that to air. But it sounds like there's actually more of a, you know, like NBC has its own team that handles that kind of stuff. Every show has a music mixer that has music or they have like um, smaller shows or syndicated shows that don't always have music. We'll have like a company, truck company come in and have like a dedicated music mixer or they will um, send the multi-track the taping and then send it back to their people to mix and send back a, a mix. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, these days there's always, always someone pretty much like. For sports and certain things, there might take just a front of house mix, you know, some lower budget things or some, it depends. But if it's a daily show like The Tonight Show, SNL, Jimmy Kimmel, they're all going to have a dedicated music mixer. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense then. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges of mixing live to air as opposed to, you know, the studio? Um, It's just a different beast altogether. Um, I mean... You still want the same goal. You want to make the song work as good as you possibly can, whether it's in the studio, whether it's live. You want to, the artist, you know, you want to represent the artist as as best you can and make them look as good as possible always. Um, But you're just fighting different battles with television. It's a shorter time window. It's not like you recorded the record and I'm going to spend three days mixing it and checking in the car and checking in my iPods and you know, all these, all these places. It's like, no, you're going to rehearse for 30 minutes. I'm going to spend an hour doing the mix and then we're going to take this mix and we're going to air. And gotcha. so, so it's, it's fast. I mean, sometimes I get more time than that, but if we don't, if I don't have time to prepare in advance where the band sends me multi-tracks in advance to do some, some kind of prep work on it, I got a 30 minute window to rehearse with the band, set mic pre-levels, multi-track, the rehearsal and then i'm playing that rehearsal back and working on a mix and i've got 55 minutes from the time we finish to the time the song airs gotcha so, so so you're yeah you're you're working pretty quick there and just doing that that the initial rehearsal recording mixing that and then that becomes your live to air okay interesting yeah the rehearsal i just go from the multi-track back to input mode and now the same mics are coming down the same mic pre's it's just instead of listening back to my Pro Tools record machine, I'm listening to the mic. So I can just flip back and forth instantly with a button. Yeah, and your signal chain's all all there and everything yeah. already. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I was curious to, to know about that. Like, obviously, um, you know, like, you have to work fast in that world. Um, but then another thing that I thought was really interesting that you had on your website was that you mentioned the idea that, you know, 
people watching these shows, they're already familiar with like the great mixes that these artists already have, you know, of their recordings. So then you kind of have this challenge of making it sound like that or making it at least familiar to that. Um, but in a way, more condensed timeline, <laughs> like, you know, an hour versus these people who spend like days or weeks on these tracks, right? Yeah, it, it does kind of add to the challenge a bit because, again, you don't have three days to mix the song where you're checking it in your car and doing all this stuff. Plus, you have to make a song sound like the single that's a number one single of the summer or something, whatever it is. It's like that's the biggest song in the moment and it's on the show and you need to make it sort of sound like that or get it close or make it sound like a more exciting live version of that song. Mm -hmm. So it definitely adds to the pressure of having to get it right. Yeah. And just to be able to work on different styles and know how to make an R&B ballad sound versus a rock and country pop kind of song versus a hip hop song versus a regular straight rock song. Um, you kind of have to have all those tools in your bag and ready to go. Of course. So how do you like prepare for that mentally? Like, are you, are you like analyzing these people's mixes before they get to the station or like, like what, what, what goes on there? Or is it just like, okay, I, this is what I've got in front of me. I only got time to just figure it out now. Sometimes I check the mixes. A lot of times I don't. Um, a lot of times I've heard the songs already. Fair. Um, so I, I probably should listen to those mixes more, but generally my instinct seems to be right because the artists seem to be happy. So um, I just, you know, try to approach it as what's going to serve the song best. And then if the artist or, or their producer or their manager or the record label or the front of house guy, or someone comes in and says, you know, you're not featuring this key line or um, we need more backgrounds. These two guys are really important for the background vocal, something like that. But in general, I think I, I, I've been lucky where I seem to kind of zone in where I need to, and it seems to work out. Yeah. So what about like things like, um, you know, obviously in a lot of these like pro mixes, like they, they have all the time in the world to work on these things and they're adding sample layers and stuff like that. Like, how do you navigate around that kind of stuff? Like, are you, are you triggering any sort of samples sometimes or is just like pure, pure line input? No samples. I mean, sometimes they have like SPD pads and stuff like that, that, you know, we'll have hand claps and that sort of stuff. Or if there's like a signature reverb thing or something that goes on with the snare. But I've just kind of come up with creative ways to kind of get that punch and that stuff using extra processing that maybe I wouldn't do versus a sample if I was making a record, you know, um, different distortions, different compressions, different exciters and um, things that will sort of give you that. And then I, you know, if, it's a certain sound they're looking for. If I'm feeling this is a dry song or a wet song or, you know, I'll just kind of go for it and just keep pushing things until I can get it there. It's interesting that, like, you, you know, you're, you're you're working with what you have there and you're, you're trying to, like, make it sound like this live album. Um, as far as, like, your mixing process goes on that side of things, do you have like templates that you work from to get started with this stuff? Or is it kind of just like every session starting from scratch because you have different artists coming in with a different backline or what whatnot? I have a massive template. I probably have one of the bigger templates, like period. People think I'm kind of crazy. Um, and I get it. There's a back and forth to like use templates, don't use templates. It takes away your creativity. I, when first started doing the Today Show and realized that like I got to pump out like 200 plus artists a year some years and you know some sometimes we're doing six songs in one performance so if i'm doing 200 performances and mixing 600 songs that year um i need a system that's going to be repeatable and it's going to work and i started to think about well like who does that and i started at the guys that i looked up to you know the michael browers the clas you know, these sort of guys, the JJPs, the guys that, yeah, they were in analog and they had a big console, but the way you work in analog is all your gears there, everything's patched to aux sends on your console, and you can grab any channel, whatever you want. So I thought about that a lot, and I thought, well, I want everything. I, I want to have everything that I could ever possibly need, and if I don't use it, so what? And if I need it, I have it. I don't have to open up a plug-in. The artist walks in my room and says, can you put this delay on my vocal? 
I don't have to load a plugin or make an aug send. I guarantee you I have something there ready to go. The vocal's already sending to it because it's sending to all the effects. And I bring up the return of the fader. And then the artist instantly lights up. And they're like, you get it. You understand <laughs> what I'm looking for. And then they're more comfortable because they're also being rushed in and out. And they don't have a lot of time. And they want to sound good. And they see that I've got this arsenal of stuff ready to go. And to me, it's not about repeating the same thing because I don't do necessarily a lot of repeating it's just having the flavors and the tones and the shapes there to grab at any time so yeah. whether i'm mixing a straight up pop song or i'm mixing a singer songwriter thing i've got whatever i need at my fingertips yeah well it makes sense it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with like just being prepared for the artist right so like your template is helping you with that and making making translate to live as well yeah yeah, all my routing, everything is set. I don't, you know, my template has, because I'm also on a digital console at NBC, so I have a console and then one Pro Tools rig that I use as like a plugin server and then another Pro Tools rig that I use as my record and playback machine. And so everything needs to be laid out with the I.O. correctly. So all my buses, all my reverbs, all my effects, uh, all my parallel stuff, all that stuff, is there and it's routed and it's patched and all I have to do is hit a button to turn it on. And then I have 130 channels of different instruments, like anything you could possibly ever need, you know, three kick drums, four snares, everything. So I get the input list for the day and then I just pick what channels I want, load them on my console, load them in my pro tools, uh, sessions and patch the mic inputs in and I'm ready to go. And it's labeled, it's routed, Basic panning is done. Each channel on my console is set up. So the aug sends that I would use on that channel are the first things I see. Everything is laid out. So you kind of create muscle memory. And every day I know what color to look at when I see something, where to go, where to grab something. And, you know, this template, you know, I use a similar one for the studio, but it's been something that I've been building since like 2006. So it's sort of just become an extension. Yeah, that makes sense. Of of me. And I can just mix into it. And if I want, I can change stuff out really easily. But still, you know, if, even though I might have an EQ and a compressor or something on a channel that's for a guitar, that could easily be changed out to something else in two seconds if I don't feel it's serving the song correctly. Mm -hmm. And that goes for everything. And usually, once every couple of months, I'll open up my template and just change everything around completely just to keep it fresh. <laughs> So I'll go in and it's like, well, I normally use the 1176 on the bass, not anymore. And I'll change it to something else or, you know, just to keep myself. And maybe what I pick on that doesn't work. And I try it two or three times and I'm not digging it. And then I'll go to the next thing or I'll make a whole new effects chain of something just to try and throw it in the template and might forget about it. And then it'll come in handy a month later and I go, oh, what about that thing I built? And then turn it on and go, oh, it's perfect for that. Yeah, I love that idea. Like, you know, having that templates up obviously makes sense and i think it it from a, a speed perspective it obviously helps but also from like a a comfort perspective with you mixing like you have to be comfortable you have to know where things are and have your workflow and you know navigate through your session so i think having templates for that are really important um but i also think it's cool to hear you talk about how you'll update your template frequently as well which i think is is, is a pretty good thing you know because most people it's like I mean, there's an argument to be made for, like, if you're already comfortable with one setting, then, like, you know, you could just stick with that and, like, you know, you never have to never have to think about it. But but I guess, like, you know, the more you mess around with stuff and the more you experiment with different pieces of equipment, the more the better you're learning all those those pieces and, and learning what applies where and, you know, all these other ways of making your mix exciting. It's sort of like uh, the template has the bones to everything there. And then I can just change out the little the little pieces as needed so you know what i mean like the guitars are always going to be routed to all the places i want guitars to that doesn't mean on the imp on the channel side or the bus side what's on those things will change all the time depending but the stuff is already built and it's there and yeah there's stuff loaded that if you gotta understand in television sometimes things get hairy you know, we do outside performances. It starts downpouring and thundering lightning. Your 30-minute rehearsal turns into five minutes, and the singer never came out. So now the first time that you're going to hear the singer is the first time everyone on TV hears the singer. So, yeah, it's good to know your stuff that, like, 
okay, I know this is going to work for a lead vocal right now if I pre-dial up all this stuff and have my hand on the mic pre for when they start singing. Like, it'll, you'll at least hear it, and it'll sit in the song. Will it be perfect? Mm-hmm. No, but I'll get through the first song without you not hearing the first word and going, where's you know, the audience going, where's the mic? Yeah, of course. Um, and that stuff happens. So you want to be like, if I have to, I could unbypass everything in my template, pull up a couple of verbs and some things, and it'll sound like a mix. Yeah. If I wanted to, but I dig in way more than that. Yeah. So I imagine that with your experience in the in the TV world and like constantly pushing yourself to mix fast every day that in the studio, you've got to be pretty quick as well. Do you find that, that does, it say, does it translate that way or, or are you like, oh, now I got more time. I can I can spend it, you know, the bulk of the mix happens just as fast, but the fine tuning will take longer because, you know, I love automation and I just love making songs move. Uh, and, you know, that's part of the template, too, is just having stuff to grab and be able to ride things up and down uh, during a song. So it takes me a little longer, but I'll mix the song in three hours, but I might spend another six hours over the course of two other three hour sessions fine tuning. You know, the first three hours, the mix will be sort of like 90 percent there. I'll check it in the car. And then come back the next day and go, all right, I know I had too much low end and the vocal was had too much mid range. I'll address that stuff, start writing in all my automation, make the song feel good, take that with me, take another quick listen in the car on my way home that night, and then come in the next day and just fine tune the automation and I'm done. So eight to twelve hours on a track. Yep. So that's a little different than the live side. <laughs> Given de- depending on how many tracks, you know. Or if it's something like I had something this week that was kind of just drums, bass, a couple of guitars and some vocals. So it was like four songs in three days. It just sort of depends. Mm -hmm. So then as far as like you mentioned how much you love automation and then that seems to take up a lot of your time um, with like that polished work. What kind of automation are you typically finding yourself doing? Like, do you you kind of have a similar approach to automation on all your mixes or um, what does that look like for you there? Um, I don't know. I mean, every song is different and I'm always finding new ways to, to make it work. But generally once I've got the basic static level of things, uh, then I go into write mode, the whole thing is written. And then pretty much I work in touch mode. I have a 24 fader, uh, D D command, the old avid. And I just like having, you know, I got 64 faders at NBC. I've always been on a large format desk going back to SSLs and Neves. So I just like to move things with my hands and and not the mouse a lot. Like I'll do fine tuning work with the mouse, but it's everything from just bringing stuff up and down in verses and choruses to panning. You know, even now a lot of my automation is the duplicate button. I duplicate a lot of stuff. So if I've got two guitars in a mix and one of them does the intro part, I might duplicate that track, pan it to the center, and only unmute the audio for the intro, so that's in mono, and then the guitars will go, you know, maybe to two tracks that are 60% wide in the verse, and then another two tracks will go to 100% wide in the chorus. So, like, panning and stuff, a lot of times I do with tracks now, and just kind of create a window of how everything works, so this way, if the artist has stuff that is in stereo in some parts of the song, but maybe there's only a mono in other parts. I'll move them to different spots just by putting them on different tracks, pan different ways. And that sort of creates my roadmap of the arrangement. And then everything else is fader and knob and me turning up and down aug sends and writing parallel stuff and writing effects. And I try to keep, you know, I have like 24 vocal effects that just, sit next to my lead vocal and they're all being sent by one aug send and they're all down and that's how i usually do vocal effects is just quickly bring them up and down and i'll blend something together but i make a little note for myself on if i bring something up i like but i don't know if it's appropriate for the full song i'll hit the mute button on that fader so i see that it's red and then during the mix anything that has a mute on i'll unmute and try to ride in and out in different parts of the song to see if maybe the bridge, this thing works, or maybe this Leslie effect in the course, 
so outro chorus vamp vocal could be cool or so it's just a quick way for me to try ideas out just by throwing faders up and down and i'm not having to open plugins and i'm not even looking at the names of the stuff yeah you know it's just more about pushing things up and down and seeing what feels good and then yeah i could go into the plugin and change a pre-delay or uh, whatever you know release or whatever but that's sort of after i've had the initial just experience of using my hands and listening and and that reaction you get just from building a mix yeah i love that you, like it's interesting that you were talking about how you'll have like all of your vocal effects on one aux end you know because like a lot of people think you got to break it out into like different aux end for each channel i just set it at zero and then it's just feeding to everything and i've got Short delays, long delays, harmonizers, yeah, big sense. reverbs, small reverbs, wacky distortion effects. Everything's all there. So then I can, you know, maybe the vocal needs nothing. So you pull up a little bit of a short room and that one fader's up for the whole song. Other times, maybe you're creating a space and you're creating a scene and there's multiple delays and multiple reverbs. I mean, that's why I like the duplicate button so much in Pro Tools because I might have one reverb and it's like kind of cool. And I go like, well, what can I do with this? And I'll just duplicate it and then change the pre-delay to something longer and change the uh, EQ on it and start to blend that under the first one. Or with distortions, you could do that. Or delays or, you know, anything else. You could just keep put. you know, if it's not like working for me, like the, going back to you talking about drum samples and I can't use them at NBC. I got to keep working the initial material that's there to make it sound like a sample. So if that means I got to duplicate that snare you know, or or put four parallels on the snare and one super distorted to get the ring and the other one's got super top end and the, that's what I got to do. So I'm just pushing and pushing until I can create the sound that I'm hearing in my head. Yeah, I love that. And I think that like the fact that you said you have just that many effects on the vocals alone, you know, I think that that, that probably does explain what your template looks like. You said it was a big uh, one. So yeah. used to have an engineer is always scratch their head when they look at my template, like what's the matter with you? And I get it. You know, it's just, I liked it. Like just, I just imagine, you know, whether I'm here on my D command or whether I'm on my console there, that it's just an old school big SSL with a hundred channels that has all my favorite outboard gear around me plugged in and patched in all the time. And I know what everything sounds like because I've been using it for so long. So when I hear a vocal that's really mid range and I go, Oh, that compressor has not going to work, but let me send it to this one. And it's already there and I could just do it. And, and it feels fast and responsive. And I'm not like, making an augs input and adding a plug in, stopping my whole process. It just happens. I never have to think about zeros and ones and technical stuff. That's all in the preparation. That's all having everything ready. So then I can just be as musical as possible. That makes a lot of sense. So then as far as like speed goes, obviously you've got this template. You talked about being like prepared as well. Um, are there any other tools that you like to use in your, either in the studio or in the live world um, to help you with your speed? Um, I mean, reps, <laughs> obviously <laughs> like put in your reps, like you just have to, I don't know how many hours I have at this point. I mean, I've had to mix like 5,000 songs at this point. So just doing it over and over is really like, what I always tell younger guys, like you better be going home tonight and mixing when you're done here because other guys will be like, you got to mix every day if you want to be fast. Like you got to do it every single day. Uh, I'll tell you one tool that's, not a human tool that I really love is uh, this app Stereo Monoizer. Love that. Love that app, man. That's great. The guys who prep my mixes for me, like when I showed them that, they were like blown away how much time it saves, you know? It's really for like 50 bucks or whatever it is. It, it's like the best money for time value <laughs> you can get not going through stereo logic files all day. Um, that is definitely was a game changer for me. Saves hours. Yeah, and for people who don't know what that is, Stereo Monoizer is a, a, an app that lets you basically take stereo files and it automatically detects if it is actually a mono file, just you know, printed as a stereo or not. And if it is, it will it'll like basically re-render your files to completely mono files and you know save save some track bandwidth in in your sessions. The amount nice. of hours in my life I had to click split into mono and delete the right side or the left side and 
put tracks together. I mean, it's like hundreds and thousands of hours that I'll never get back. <laughs> and that saves every week. You know, it really does speed up how many mixes that, that can get prepped in, in one sitting. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's like anything you can do to work faster is always good. And uh, a tool like that, it's like, yeah, when you're mixing on a regular basis, you get files all the time that are like that. So it's like find an app that saves that time and, and you know, short shortcut your your session time and your prep, your prep time. And you, you will be very thankful afterwards for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just that and knowing your tools and knowing your layout and just working in it day in and day out. Oh, when you're monitoring all that basic sort of stuff, that's what's going to improve your workflow more than like a plug-in or something usually. I mean, there's some stuff, you know, that obviously helps vocal align and different things like that, but just doing it day ever after day after day after day. Yeah, absolutely. As far as your process when you start a mix, like where do you typically begin there? Because obviously in the live world, you're probably throwing everything up at once and just trying to quickly prioritize. But like in the studio world, how do, what does that look like for you? Uh, it's sort of both the same. I uh, usually, if, uh, how do I describe this? Okay, so at NBC, when I do the rehearsal, the control room is also listening. So I can't like solo, th- you know, I'm not really doing a lot of soloing and that sort of thing. I'm trying to leave a basic mix up so other people can hear what's going on. The director can time out, gotcha. camera shots, that sort of stuff. So it's a team effort. So I have to sort of be careful Um, So normally, whether it's in the studio or live, I create a rough mix. Uh, My template already, the faders are sort of at a starting point where like a couple of things and some mic pre-moves, and it sort of sounds like a basic faders up rough mix. I start like that. I get my panning right. I start to think about what I'm hearing as far as like if it's a live thing. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of rumble or I'm hearing a lot of cymbal splash. Where is that coming from? I'll start muting things. And find, okay, it's the background vocal on this side that's got a lot of pick drum in it or whatever. Um, and I'll kind of take a note of that. Note, I'll take a note overall of the sonic quality of what the mix sounds like with just the faders up and nothing going on. And it's like in my mind, okay, I know where I want to take this now and what it's sounding like, what the issues are. And then I kind of mute everything but the vocal and start with the vocal. Um I push the vocal fader up as high as I think I'll I'll know in my I know in my template roughly where like the max I want to take it to hit all my stuff and I'll start with that at the loudest part of the song and try to get the vocal vibing and feeling good and just get I'm not going to go crazy spending like eight hours on the vocal but I'm going to clean up anything that's bad in it any rumble any bleed uh, you know any good bleed push out some more if I can. Um, get it compressed a little EQ a little bit, but more clean up. I don't want to like make it super bright yet or anything. And then I'll quickly, like I said, pull up some faders for effects and create something. So it feels like a great starting point. And then I'll start to work the drums and the bass around that. And then everything else comes in after. And then, you know, by the time I get everything in, you know, I might go back, the vocal will get a little brighter. Maybe they'll get more top end on the snare. I try not to overdo one thing. Thing. I try to make them all, I try to work everything together. I'm not someone who can't solo. I know some guys say, like, I never solo. I kind of take it in two approaches. I solo, try to find any issues, listen for is, you know, if you've got a lot of open mics or a lot of stuff, something is causing that problem. What is it? Okay, it's the mandolin is getting all this snare drum bleed into it, or it's this tom tom is getting all of uh, this hi-hat in it and so i take a note of that sort of stuff and work that stuff out but once i've got everything cooking i'm not soloing anymore and it's just more about really starting to push things as far as i can take it you know within context of the song i always try to look at it as like i'll listen to that rough mix i had or the artist rough mix and you know, when I was growing up as a kid, everyone had Sony and Iowa boom boxes and they all had like the 3D button and the max bass button or the loud button. <laughs> and I always try to look at it as my mix should be like I'm hitting the 3D button. What they gave me is their concept and their idea. And let me just hit the 3D button on that and make it come to life. Yeah. Um, so that, I'm man. just trying to start to move things and give stuff energy to kind of create that vibe. 
absolutely. Well, to go back to your your point about the solo button, it's like it's not that soloing is a bad thing, you know, for anyone listening to this. Solo can actually be a very helpful tool, and I think the way you described how you use it, I think, is the intention. It, that's kind of like the intended use for it. Um, it's when you're like only listening to things in solo and not putting it into context that that you can make a lot of mistakes that way, right? And and that that's what you said you do. Yeah, like let's say I've got my vocal, my drums, and my bass cooking, and now I go to guitar, and I bring the guitar fader up. I'll want to solo that guitar just so I can hear like, okay, is there some rumble? Do I got to put a high-pass filter in? You know, in the studio, maybe it's a high-pass filter. Live, maybe I've also got kick drum bleeding into it from like a sub, so maybe I got to go in and dynamically EQ 60 hertz or something out of that guitar track so it's not messing with the kick drum and now i've got room to play with the guitar and if i want to put a compressor on it or something i can and the kick drum's not triggering that compressor so yeah i've got a solo just to sort of i look at it this way if i'm either getting tracks from someone else or it's a live thing that solo time is my version of being able to do the tracking and sit there and go let's move the mic let's uh, change the mic let's change the drum head i don't have time for a lot of that stuff as a mixer or someone mixing live television you got to get up and go so if i can't retune the floor tom and it's got this flappy rumble on it i need to solo that figure out what it is and see if there's something technically i can do to fix it yeah that makes a lot of sense so same thing with eq where a lot of times with the live stuff or poorly recorded stuff if i get stuff that's not recorded that great to mix I'm almost soloing the stuff and like pre-treating it. Like there'll be like an EQ and a compressor type of thing just to get it to sound pleasing to me, sort of not a super hype thing, but just enough to be like, I would record it this way. This is how it would sound if it was me recording it. Yep. And then I can put everything in. And then if I have to add more processing, like now I'm mixing the track that I recorded. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting way to look at it. But yeah, absolutely makes a lot of sense because, yeah, especially whenever for people who are just mixing other people's recordings, like you didn't have any say in that. So you got to you got to figure out how to get it closer to where you want it to be. And these days, you know, artists are like at least doing 50 percent of their stuff now. So as much as you can guide them and say, hey, you know, maybe let's try this with your overhead. So the snare drums in the center for me. Uh, or or stuff like that. You don't always have that luxury if the conversation didn't happen beforehand. You know, I always try to get the artist to, hey, you're recording yourself. Let's hop on a call. You know, what are you doing? You know, maybe there's something I can do to help you so the mix turns out better. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that's like that's that's the mark of someone that's like good to work with. You know, <laughs> like when someone actually cares about your project enough that they're going to help you like make sure you're taking the right steps to track it properly. And then, you know, in the end, everyone wins because you get a better product to, to work on the mixing. And then in the end, the, the mix is better. The band's happier. Like, you know, it's, it's win-win for everyone. So um, yeah, I think that, that is really important. And I think that like, I mean, you, you could potentially even charge more for that because you're like, you're making your, your quality so much better, you know, maybe not necessarily charging more for like the, the consultation necessarily, but, but in the end, it's like the quality you're getting is better. So it kind of warrants a higher price in the end, you know, because I, I think I, I don't look at that so much as like this, uh, a money making thing as much more as creating a relationship for a long term working relationship. I of want course. them to know that I really care and this is what I do, and this is what I love doing, and I want you guys to get the best product, and I'm always going to go as far as I can take it for you. Yeah, you know? of course. And then you hope those people come back, and they call their friends and tell them to come. You know, that's sort of the payoff, is to getting to work on more music. Yeah, it all goes hand in hand together, for sure. Um, so then... All this said, like, how do you know when you're ultimately done with your mix now? Like, you know, obviously in the live world, you're just, you're, you have to work really quickly and it's done when it's done. But like, as far as the studio side of things, how do you know when, like, it's, uh, it's Usually it's done? when I hate it and I think it sounds horrible and I'm disgusted <laughs> with it, then I'm like, all right, time to send it off because I'm just going to screw this up if I go anymore. <laughs> and usually it's like, oh man, this sounds great. And usually I'm like, oh, it's horrible. You know, it's just, I'm very self conscious about my work. Like, I never am comfortable with it you know i love that that's your cutoff point because most people would be like when i'm like thinking it's the best thing ever right so it's like sometimes you have to step outside of your comfort zone and just put it out there and see what happens right yeah i I had a mastering guy tell me the other day because i'm always like worried about my stuff and he's like you know 
you shouldn't be worried. It's fine. And I'm like, no, this is not. And he's like, he's like, no, it's like the people that are overconfident, they're usually the ones that, you know, seem to have the bad mixes. It's, yeah. it's, the, it's <laughs> the people that are unsure that seem to send me stuff. And I'm like, no, it's fine. But like, he talked me off a ledge recently um, about that sort of stuff. <laughs> Well, I think that there's there's a lesson there, you know? It's like, it doesn't have to be perfect for it to be done. And oftentimes, I think you'll be surprised at how happy you can make your clients when you just submit it at that stage, you know? Like, it, sometimes it proves that you don't need to do more because someone else then verifies that or validates it, you know? Yeah, you know, I always often wonder, like, the last hour or two I spent, did it get better or did it just get different? Sometimes it's hard to step away. You know, and sometimes if you step away two hours ahead, you might find less changes than you stayed the two hours and dug yourself. You know, I don't know if you ever saw like the painter Bob Ross. Yeah. He used to do like all, he would always have like this beautiful painting and then like slam this like brown line down the middle of it and be like, oh, this is a happy mistake. And then have to dig his way out of it by turning it into a tree or something. I feel like I do that a lot. Like I'll get things really like good but then I'll want to do something to it to push it over the top. And it'll be this like, it's really good. And then I'll go into this valley of like despair because I tried to do this thing that messed it all up. And then I have to turn the corner. And then when I come out and out, <laughs> out of the valley in the end, back to the mountain, it's right. It's just like, I had to go through this process of, of, yeah, I rock to I'm the worst to this idea is really cool to you screwed this whole thing up to it's done. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's 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 I, I don't know else how to describe it. It's just I think if you do this for so long, no matter what, you just are always striving to make it better than the last one. Of course. Well, again, there's that like, um, yeah, there's that that personal growth that you want to see, right? You want to see that every mix is getting better and better and that you're like continuously growing in that sense. Um, so because of that, you're just, you're always trying to push yourself or you're trying to learn something new in the, in the process of it or, you know. Yeah. Like I said, I had recently revisited some stuff I did and one project was 14 years old and one was five years old. And both of them luckily were recorded very well. Uh, and when I went back and listened to the mixes, it's funny how I thought, you know, my balances are the same. The mix isn't as good, but it's almost like as humans, we hear balance a certain way. And as mixers, we sort of always balance things the way we hear them. We just sonically grow to add the width and the depth and the feel and everything else around it. But so it was like when I was remixing these tracks, even the ones from five years ago, it was like I hit the 3D button on myself and and blew them up even bigger. So I felt like, well, okay, I've grown as a mixer and I feel... I feel good that I could beat what I did yeah. years ago. Um, but it was just interesting to me that I was, I was AB and I was like, you know, my balances are sort of like the same. It's sort of, you know, even stuff that I've listened to that I did 20 years ago. Like, I feel like I balance sort of the same. I don't know if that's like the curve in our ear or in our heads, but. I think that makes sense. It's like, I, I feel like the more music you listen to, your ears just get like tuned to that standard, you know? So like, and I don't know, I don't know about you, but like, I personally still listen to like a lot of the music that I listened to, you know, like 10, 15 years ago. Like I probably listen to a lot more of that stuff than I do a lot of new stuff. So like my ears just still kind of stuck in that world sometimes, but then I hear new stuff on the radio and I'm like, oh, they're doing this cool new thing. Like I got to like learn that technique. And then that, that slowly, I, I, I think kind of turns into that 3d button for you. You know, it's like where all of a sudden you're now introducing this new layer on top of like your foundation. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So and in the end, what ultimately makes a great mix to you? Oh, uh, I think it's just feel. I mean, I know that's like cheesy and oversaid. It just doesn't feel good. It's it's I spent a lot of time early in my career trying to make stuff sound good. And that doesn't really always do it. Um everything sounding perfect just doesn't do it. Um a good mix just feels good, whether you know, like, I mean, you listen to, like, an old Wilson Pickett record or or Joe Cocker and, like, you know, every, the tape machines, like, sound like they're about to catch on fire. There's so much <laughs> distortion, you know? And you listen to stuff and it feels so good. It just feels so good. And, like, you know, you're not even, your brain isn't like, oh, that's distorted. It's just, like, it feels great. And I think 
whether you're doing a modern pop thing that's super loud with tons of low end or you're doing a singer songwriter thing that's delicate it's got to feel good and there's no like eq curve or magic plugin to do that and that really as much as we like to kind of make our our jobs seem like it's so much if the song is really good it doesn't matter you know it's true you can if the song isn't really good it none of this stuff matters at all you can mix it all you want but no one's really going to enjoy it yeah that makes a lot of sense for sure yeah you can't uh perfection doesn't really mean that people are going to like the song you know it's it's it really comes down to that right absolutely um and, and i don't even mean perfection like everything's got to be put in its place or the most sonically perfect mix it's just when good songs are written and they're played by good players it does something emotionally to people and it doesn't matter what was recorded with one microphone you know on a cassette deck or you know uh, at the hit factory like it's it doesn't matter it's a great song people are going to love it and they're going to react to it and all we can do is try to enhance that as much as possible love it right on man well, dude, I don't want to take up much more of your time. If people want to learn more about you, maybe even potentially work with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, Matt Ruffino, music mixer dot com or uh, Magic Matt Mixing on Instagram. That seems to be where most people find me. I put up a lot of posts to different mixes and different stuff I'm doing on there. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely include those in the show notes for people to easily access. Awesome. Right on, man. Well, dude, thank you so much again for doing this. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Love the podcast. Thank you, man. So that was my interview with Matthew Rufino, and I really enjoyed that. I thought it was really interesting to learn more about what goes on behind the scenes with these live to air performances that you see on TV, like the Today Show. And I thought it was really fascinating to learn kind of his process behind that and how he'll work from just a rough sound check and ultimately use that as the basis for what we ultimately hear on air, which is really interesting. And it makes sense, but it also goes to show you how stressful of a situation it could be, especially when things don't go as planned, like you said, where maybe it's raining and, you know, that hour long sound check that you had then gets condensed into like five minutes or whatever. Right. So I thought it was really interesting. And I think that it says a lot about Matthew's preparation. And I, I know that that's something he talked uh, talked about in this episode as well, you know, and the importance of being prepared to not only make the entire experience better for the artist, but also for yourself, right? So by having things like his templates and all that kind of stuff mapped out ahead of time, it allows him to work fast. And I think that that's something that, yeah, if you're working live, you can definitely apply this. If you're working in the studio, you can definitely apply it. Um, but definitely learn from that. And in your own process, try try to find ways to shortcut that process and make it more efficient and constantly be reevaluating to see, you know, what do I do now that I didn't do maybe six months ago? How can I incorporate that into my templates or make this work a little bit more efficiently, right? All those kind of things are going to just help you have a clearer mind going into these projects and ultimately feel way more comfortable and confident even when things would otherwise be stressful. So yeah, I definitely really enjoyed learning a lot about that. And I hope that you learned a lot of lessons along the way here too. And if you did and you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to it. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday morning. And if you're looking for help with your mixes, if you're not sure what to do to help get your song sounding at the same quality levels as your favorite artists, and you're not sure what you should be doing with things like EQ or compression or miking your instruments or, you know, what you should be doing throughout the mixing process or the editing process, that kind of stuff. If you're looking for one-on-one -on -one help to get you that clarity that you need in order to get your mixes sounding just as good as your favorite records, then I would love to help you out throughout that process. Inside of my coaching program, Amplitude, I work one-on-one -on -one with all of my students to help you get the answers that you need. And I literally will listen to your mixes and give you actionable feedback in terms of what things you should be doing to get to that next level with your tracks. And in addition to that one-on-one -on -one feedback, you also get access to a huge library of training to help you throughout that recording, editing, and mixing process. And you also get access to mastering and a whole bunch of other great stuff. So if you're trying to finish a record and you're looking for help to ultimately cross that finish line, then make sure to visit masteryourmix.com forward slash amplitude. And I would love to help you out throughout that process and get you the answers that you need and get you that support that you need. So make sure to check that out. Once again, masteryourmix.com forward slash amplitude. All right, with that said, we've reached the end of the episode. Thank you so much for sticking around to the very end, and I can't wait to chat with you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. 
To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at MasterYourMix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit MasterYourMix.com. 